uh, EVs, EVs in Hawaii impact on uh, CO2 emissions level today here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. My co-host is uh, Mitch Ewan. Uh, our primary guest, uh, wave, wave, Mitch, uh, uh, like we did that. Good, good work. Um, yeah. And um, our primary guest is Kathy McKenzie from HNEI. Uh, and our immediate guest is Peter Russek, spokesman for uh, Hawaiian Electric. Hi, Peter. Wow, exciting. What a group. Uh, an important show. And Peter's going to talk first. He's, he's going to talk about a, a new program that Hawaiian Electric just rolled out to uh, incentivize uh, batteries with, uh, with, with clean energy installations which is very exciting and probably takes us to a new level on the road to 2045. Don't you agree, Peter? I agree. That's one of the main objectives and one of the, our, we hope, outcomes of what we're calling battery bonus. We are paying an incentive. Uh, you know, never say Hawaiian Electric never gave you anything because uh, we're paying cash money to people who have an existing solar system to add a battery, add energy storage, and people who are installing or planning to install uh, a rooftop solar system to add energy storage to their system. So uh, it's about, we're, we're good for about 50 megawatts of storage. Uh, the first 15 megawatts, the customers who apply for the first 15 megawatts will get $850 a kilowatt hour, which uh, on a system of five kilowatts, if my math is correct, is 4,250 bucks. So, you know, that's that's significant change. And we really hope uh, people step up and take advantage of it. And the next, after that, the tiers step down a bit. But the point is, we really want to encourage energy storage. We're building our own large batteries. Uh, some of the new solar uh, installations and wind installations have their own batteries. But, uh, you know, we have well over 80,000 customers out there. Uh, about 60,000 that customers here on Oahu who have rooftop solar. And if they all have batteries, uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to be moving forward uh, at a very fast clip. A couple of questions, Peter. So the total, um, at least in the report in PBN, was $4,250. I mean, how, if you calculate it right out to the, the max, that would, that would be the total. Um, what, what would a battery system cost? In other words, how much of the cost of the battery system is covered by this incentive? Yeah, uh, I, I'm not in the battery business, but from the people that I talk to who are in the business, they say this would be somewhere between one third and one half of, a, of an installation of that size. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, uh, small, not small change and it's a significant addition. You know, already uh, of, of the new installations that we have applications that are in process, nearly 80% of those already planned for solar, uh, solar plus storage. So this incentive, you know, is just going to make it easier for them to do what they already wanted to do. Uh, and if anybody is was not planning to do so, uh, solar plus storage, this should really incentivize them to talk to their contractor and take another look. Economically, how does this compare with the benefits they would have, would have had, uh, had the legislature finally gotten around to pass the bill uh, to give it, uh, what, a tax credit uh, to a similar installation? I, I don't know the numbers. I, I do know that in some cases, people can qualify for the federal tax credits, uh, kind of thing we don't like to give advice on, but we recommend that people talk to their tax preparer and understand because this incentive uh, will have tax implications for everyone who takes it. It is going to be considered income. We're going to supply the forms to the customer and the owner of the system and send them to the IRS. So uh, you should not, uh, you know, it, there are always considerations. We're not suggesting anybody jump in without taking a careful look. Uh, the other thing I would say is it's very important to understand most people who have solar on their roof are already getting compensation for electricity they send to the grid, right? Uh, the older uh, installations have net energy metering, which is full retail value. The later ones of the last five years or so uh, get a, a portion of, their re of the retail uh, for electricity they send to the grid. And they're still going to get all that. That's not going away. That's not affected. So taking this incentive does not uh, in any way change their, their participation in these other programs. 
And what we are asking, what we require uh, for taking the incentive is that you, uh, the customer commits to a uh, two hour period in the evening during the peak, uh, during which they will either use the electricity from their battery for their own home needs or business needs uh, on site, or that if they have excess, they will send that to the grid. And so uh, we are doing this for a good reason. It's going to help uh, to solidify the, the grid. It's gonna help make the grid firmer and get us uh, forward in that respect. And as a side benefit or as an additional benefit, we believe a lot more people will step up and want to have rooftop solar, which is the ultimate objective. By 2045, our strategy says we have to basically cover every roof on Oahu that could take a rooftop solar system. Few, few roofs can't do it, they're in the shade or whatever. But we, we're if we don't do that, we're going to have to cover over the landscape with solar, with wind, and we can't do that. We're not going to do that. So we need to get every single roof that possibly can have solar to have solar. And ideally, those will all have batteries. And that will be a very comprehensive renewable system alongside the other pieces, which is the big solar installations, a couple of wind farms, uh, some, some biofuel, uh, and uh, so it's an important yeah. part of getting to this is definitely going to change change it from the point of view of the homeowner. Um, and I, I just, one one question it's just it's just as a comment from me. You don't have to opine on it, but it seems to me this is depending on your you know, tax bracket. This is uh, this is the substantial amount of money that you're going to get uh, for this kind of installation, and it it may be uh, near or maybe even exceed. Uh, depending on your tax bracket, what you might get if that bill were finally passed. And I suppose we should not uh, rule out the possibility that someday it will pass, um, but it hasn't passed in the past five years, and that's some indication. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, you mentioned that it can, that it can, that the individual homeowner can use the power uh, for his home uh, right. in that that two two hour period, or uh, it could go to the grid, um, which both seem, you know, perfectly useful. But the question is, who decides? Is it automated, uh, or does the uh, electric company decide, or does he decide? Who decides? Now, the it is a, basically an automated system controlled by the mechanism of the of the solar and the battery. Uh, the the system will be set up so it gives some uh, priority to the battery to be charged, so that by Six o'clock in the evening, there is some uh, there is a charge there, and then it'll prioritize serving the ho the household, and then with excess serving the uh, uh, the the grid. So it is basically uh, insurance that we do not have to serve those households at that that time of day. Obviously, six o'clock, there's no more solar being generated. So uh, all those solar systems that do not have batteries. Are we have to supply the energy from our Hawaiian electric plants and the other plants that serve us. So this is a way of saying, we don't have to worry about those guys. They're gonna take care of themselves. And if there's extra, they will send it to the grid and the grid will distribute it to the people that don't have uh, solar for whatever reason or the, the businesses or whatever. So it is a, a particular kind uh, of demand response that is, it's scheduled, it's, it's required. So it's not responding to some uh, you know, difficulty or anything like that. So we don't control it, it'll be controlled as part of the agreement. Uh, and you know, people do have to make their, meet their commitments and they, we believe they, they will. Um, so uh, you know, there is a system for termination and so forth. Obviously, if somebody you know falls back out of it, we have to be able to to, to terminate them. But uh, in general, this is not going to be a problem. So uh, we're we're very uh, optimistic that this is going to before before we leave the subject. I want to ask a couple yeah. of other things. Sure. Um, one one is um, what what are the limitations on the program? And is it, there's a specific limitation about about how many what years, how many uh, kilowatts can, can be covered by it? What, what is that? And, well, first and that of all, means, how, yeah. how do I apply so I get in before the limitation? Very good. First of all, it's only for Oahu. 
Secondly, uh, it is limited at a total storage of, of 50 megawatts. So that's a lot of systems. If you figure the average or typical one might be five kilowatts, 50 megawatts is a lot. But for sure, we think it'll be taken up excuse me, fairly quickly. Uh, the first 15 megawatts customers who, who apply will get the full $850 per kilowatt. The second group will get uh, $750, I think, and the third group will get $500. Still nice, but you know, obviously, we're trying to make this happen quickly. Uh, we have uh, you know good reasons to to want to move this program along. So we're saying, come you know, first come first serve. And what you need to do, go to the website HawaiianElectric.com/batterybonus, uh, all one word, and read it over and just understand the very basics about it. And then you need to talk to a a solar contractor who is going to be. Um, installing a battery for you and is going to be able to tell you what it's going to cost and, and have the other particulars of the system that's required. You need to have a building permit and so forth and so on. So um, it's not the kind of thing that you can do on your own. You really do need to talk to your solar contractor. If you've got one, if you don't have one, we always say get three bids and uh, you know pick one who uh, you like because they give, they're giving you a good price and giving you good service and so forth and are you know they'll help you figure out how much of a system you can you can afford yeah, the idea is to do it right away though if you want to get in on this I don't think I wouldn't I wouldn't dawdle I would not but uh, you know it's not gonna it's not gonna disappear in the next 20 minutes I think we're going to see it over the next couple of weeks. Uh, a substantial uptake in this, but uh, you know, take your time. Think about the tax implications. Think about you know any other concerns you may have, and uh, you know. But then, but yeah, but don't wait around. Uh, this is uh, okay. So, Mitch, uh, you have questions, comments, concerns. Uh, this is your big opportunity. Yeah, I have a comment. Is this a made in Hawaii solution? Are we the uh, first people in the country to be doing this kind of? No. Program? Not exactly. Uh, I just saw Arizona Public Service is doing uh, an incentive program, but theirs is more about emergencies. There's more, they, they are more, uh, you know, we'll give you a bonus to put in a battery. And if we need to draw on that battery, uh, we will. Uh, so, you know, it's not a unique uh, program. It's not a unique approach. But I think in terms of the absolute requirement, uh, it's kind of unusual. We are saying this is a firm commitment. This is going to be scheduled. Every day of the week, including weekends and holidays, your system is going to be uh, taking care of your own needs first, and then sending the excess to the to the grid. And so that's, I think, uh, I don't know if it's the first, I don't know if it's the only, but I think it's fairly unusual. And so this, is part, this is part of um, um, making up for the termination of coal in uh, September 2022. Uh, it's creating a, a, a greater supply of renewables to do that. So it's, That's right. Right, right in, in, in line. Yeah. We've been planning for this for many years, and uh, we've been doing a number of things, some of them visible, some of them behind the scenes to get ready. This is another thing that's going to help us be ready so that when AES turns off in September 22, uh, you won't even notice it. It'll be, uh, we, we're bound and determined that it'll be seamless. So. Uh, yeah, it's all part of that. Okay, Mitch, you got something else? I heard you. I heard you start something. Uh, I just want one, one other thought: as batteries do degrade over time, I, I'm assuming there's some uh, factor that's built into this whole system to allow for the fact that batteries do degrade over time. Sure, there's a, the the actual program has a time limit, and uh, in a couple of years uh, there will be a, an option for. Uh, perhaps a different kind of program that people who are in it will be able to say, I think I want to stick with what I've got, or I want to go to this new program. It hasn't been developed yet, but it will be. Uh, so yeah, we, we understand all that. And, and certainly the engineers who are running it understand it. So uh, yeah, it's, it, there's, there's some things still to figure out because we're moving quickly, but we're going to figure them out and we're going to do the best we can for our customers. And I now I want to get out of the way. I want Kathy you know, this is, uh, I'm glad to talk about this for the full hour and a quarter or whatever, but uh, I want to say thank you very much for uh, letting me come on for this. And uh, I'm going to going to drop out and listen to the rest of the show uh, with everybody else. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Peter Rosick, spokesman for Hawaiian Electric. Thank you so much. Aloha. Okay, so now we get to introduce Kathy. And Mitch, I'm going to leave that exquisite experience to you. 
Yeah, Kathy's yeah. one of my colleagues at HNEI, and uh, she's been working on electric vehicles uh, and uh, ever since I uh, joined at HNEI. So Kathy, uh, you're world famous now. I saw your uh, a copy of a, a paper that was written based on, on your work in the uh, London uh, Daily Mail. And I said, wow, this, uh, I got to check this out. <laughs> and that was only like <laughs> earlier this week. So I'm, I think uh, millions of people have probably uh, read at least the substance of what you're going to tell us today. So I'm going to turn it over to you now and uh, run us through uh, electric vehicles and uh, the impact they have on climate change and particularly uh, CO2 emissions here in uh, Hawaii. Uh, I, I understand that your, your uh, study was done based on Oahu and not all of Hawaii. So, so why don't you take it away? All right, well, thanks so much for the kind introduction, Mitch. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, just note London Daily Mail picked that up from the UH news story the day it came out or a few hours later. So they were really quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's also been in the Honolulu Advertiser in the front page last week and then a follow-up editorial uh, that the paper wrote. So it's it's really nice to see the word get out and, and see Hawaii in the news. Right. So you have a, a, a nice slide deck here, and uh, I'm going to invite you to, uh, we don't want it to be death by PowerPoint, but uh, yeah. it gets a little bit of structured. I mean, this is, a, this is not necessarily a simple... Um, situation here and uh, so to help us understand um, the uh, impact of electric vehicles on uh, fossil fuel use and uh, CO2 emissions, let's uh, start wandering our way through the slide deck starting with uh, talking about the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. We're part of the University of Hawaii, we're a research institute as I'm sure you've heard from Mitch. And I've had the pleasure of working across all the different areas of renewable energy with the Institute um, and focusing in on electric vehicles and that combination of renewable energy. And so the impacts that I've been looking at are the impact on reducing fossil fuel use and emissions over the years. And of course, some years ago, there was a question, well, you know, in Hawaii, we still burn oil for electricity. So are we really reducing uh, CO2 emissions or even fossil fuel use for that matter? So this study dives into that, and um, this was published in the World Electric Vehicle Journal. I'll give the reference at the end in case you'd like to look. It's a peer-reviewed open access uh, paper, so anybody can go on there and uh, have a look for free and download the paper if they want to read it um, at length. And uh, so I talked a bit about HNEI and the different areas. And so why is it so important for us to get off fossil fuel? I think we've had this conversation for a long time and we're a little bit isolated. So of course, importing fossil fuels like petroleum oil and coal for that matter um, costs an awful lot of money. And we rely on that for electricity and for transportation in Hawaii. I really love this slide because it really shows where we are stuck out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And so this is a really brilliant slide. Like, look at all that blue water between us and anybody else. Yeah, this slide, actually, I nicked it from Leon Roos, but he was fine with that. And uh, I like this because it shows, uh, when you talk to people on the mainland, um, it shows what the situation is for us. We don't um, have our power grids even connected inter-island, let alone across these massive intercontinental uh, power grids. So we're, we've got a bit of a different situation here. And the cost of electricity, uh, the cost of energy total in Hawaii can run as high as 10% of the gross domestic product. So the sooner we get all that renewable energy and good storage, like Peter was talking about on the power grid, the sooner we get off um, petroleum for both transportation and for electricity, the better off we are. So this is looking at Oahu being the uh, most challenging of the islands. The neighbor islands, of course, are ahead on renewable energy. There's some geothermal on the big island, as everybody knows, and Kauai has some hydropower. So um, in Maui, just a lot more onshore wind. And so it's a bit easier to, do, to balance that solar energy. And moving forward in Hawaii, we have a good pipeline a solar power plus battery energy storage coming up, and even better now with the, the new HECO program. And so this uh, information I dug into the U.S. Energy Information Administration and also to 
the Hawaiian Electric Company's RPS reports to the legislature each year. And so that has that RPS report has a much more in-depth um, measurement of the renewable energy, which you can see on the Oahu graph here. Petroleum is the bright red at the base, which is about 55% of our um, electricity uh, power generation in the year 2020. And compared with the US nationally, that little sliver of red at the top on the right is how much oil is used to generate electricity. So the question comes up because we're burning oil for electricity, what does that mean for electric vehicles? And this is from a presentation from the Hawaii Climate Conference in 2020, um, just addressing some of the uh, persistent myths surrounding electric vehicles. Um, and today we're just focusing in on the uh, fossil fuel use and emissions. So for this study, rather than look at all the makes and models of, of vehicles, I looked at the average passenger and average freight vehicles and very efficient passenger vehicles in electric vehicles and gasoline powered vehicles. There's less than 1% passenger vehicles that are powered by diesel on the island. So not too much focus on that, but for freight vehicles, of course, there are, there are plenty of uh, freight vehicles powered by diesel. So that's included. The um, passenger vehicles are all light duty vehicles, including um, cars, SUVs, vans, pickup trucks, and freight vehicles refers to all medium and heavy duty vehicles, including delivery vans, buses, and heavy trucks. So the big difference with electric vehicles is the energy efficiency. This information is from Department of Energy. Um, it shows all the different moving parts of uh, a gasoline car in the top. And gasoline vehicles, although there's been an enormous amount of emphasis to um, have them become more efficient, over the years, they still only achieve about 17 to 20% of the energy stored in the gasoline to power the wheels. So that's how much you get out of that gasoline to move the car down the road. And compared with electric vehicles, they get over 77% of electric energy from the grid. So when you plug it into the wall or the charger, uh, you get over 77%. Some get up into the 90% in the efficiency. I love this slide because it really uh, shows you how many parts there are in an internal combustion engine car. I've never seen it displayed like that, whereas in an electric vehicle, there's very few, uh, actually, there's very few parts in an electric vehicle. Yeah. So less to go wrong as well. Exactly. Maintenance is about 50%. All the studies are coming out now so far. Of course, electric vehicles are evolving rapidly. I, what I did not compare in this was the performance. And I, you see a lot of studies where they compare. There was one recently comparing a Model S, a Tesla, no, sorry, the Model S3 with a Toyota Corolla. Um, and in the end, you know, it, it caused less CO2 emissions. Um, but the, this, I think, um, Qantas partnered with Tesla and invited Tesla Model S to raise the Boeing 737 jet. It's available on YouTube. It's a bit of fun to watch. And that uh, gives you an idea of, of what an electric vehicle can do. And not just Tesla, all of them. They all have instant torque. Uh, so it's a completely different uh, experience. And also the towing capacity is fantastic. There's a GM ad, I think it is, I've heard of. And they tow a railway car with a pickup truck. That's another great, ad, another great slide. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun one. So in the year 2020, passenger vehicles on the left and freight vehicles on the right the average gasoline vehicle is the column on the left and the efficient gasoline vehicle column on the right. This is the fossil fuel use over that year, uh, 455 gallons for your average gasoline vehicle and about 200 gallons for the very efficient 50 mile per gallon type um, gasoline vehicle. And then the average and efficient electric vehicles, the equivalent fossil fuel use in gallons of gasoline that's equivalent uh, Fossil fuel use uh, for the electric vehicles is on the right. And the average electric vehicle uses about one seventh the amount of fossil fuel as the average gasoline passenger vehicle in 2020. Is and that taking, is that, uh, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt, but is that taking into account the oil we use or the fossil fuel we use on our grid? That's what this slide's all about. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're, we're focusing in on the fossil fuel. And then on the right, the freight vehicles, you can see the average freight to the average electric vehicle, it's about one fifth the amount of fossil fuel used. So then looking forward to the projections for renewable energy on the left is from Hawaiian Electric Industries press releases. So this is renewable energy in the green line going up to 100% and they're aiming to achieve that early by 2040. And then the corresponding fossil fuels dropping off in the orange line. And then on the right is our RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standards Goals, to reach 100% renewables by 2045. And the stages in between um, of the goals in the black dots. Beyond solar and wind resources for Oahu, we're looking at technology innovations. Just as for the Renewable Portfolio Standard to reach 100%, we're, we're banking on some technology innovations. And I'll uh, briefly touch on that a little, little later. For, the, for people from the neighbor islands who'd like to see where they are, of course, the renewable energy portion is already further along that curve. So they can, they can pat themselves on the back. They're doing well when it comes to this. So then looking, for, looking ahead to 2050 for each vehicle, the passenger vehicles on the left again and freight on the right, gasoline is at the top. Um, and this is the fossil fuel use, followed by diesel. And then the efficient gasoline in the dark red about halfway down on the left. And then average electric vehicle in blue and dark blue for the efficient electric vehicle. So in 2020, we're seeing that one seventh for the average electric vehicle compared to the average gasoline. That's how much fossil fuel it was using. And it drops down to, in this scenario, we're looking at 2040 uh, to reach zero uh, fossil fuel on the grid. And clearly, if you looked at 2045 to reach 100% renewables, it, it could, the line would be a, a little bit less of a, a slope. And same for freight vehicles. And because freight vehicles are generally just a lot larger and tend to travel a lot further every year, um, the per vehicle difference is enormous. So there's a huge saving there. So this doesn't this doesn't imply though that we're going to have no fossil fuel cars by 2045 or 2050 because there's there's a you know a, a you know, cars last more than one or two years. So it's going to take a while to flush them out of the system. Is that kind of reflected in here or is that? Yeah, I'll talk some more about scenarios as we go through. And part of this idea is to look and see the scenarios or to see what if and see what difference does it make? How far can we get? And I do have, you're ahead of the, the game. Uh, I do have a slide for the electric vehicle adoption and two projections for that. And so looking at CO2 emissions, and CO2 emissions are a standard measure for greenhouse gas emissions. And again, over the, um, over the space of time from 2020 to 2040, the CO2 emissions drop off for passenger and freight vehicles. And the biofuels and waste energy, of course, continue to produce some emissions. And so for simplicity's sake for this study, um, I use the 2020 levels of bioresources and waste energy. Not to say that that won't change, but just for this, to have a look at what we know now and fix something in place so we can look at these variables of the change in renewables and the change in electric vehicles. Here's the projections for electric vehicles. So on the left is the more aggressive projection with global EV. This is from a international global EV projection to reach 12.5, 12.25% of vehicles on the road to be electric by 2030. And reaching forward to 2050, it's a, what happens if we reach 100% electric vehicles or close to that on the road by 2050. And on the right, this is the projection from the Hawaiian Electric Company and their electrification of transportation roadmap. So this is to reach 55% of electric vehicles on the road by 2045, so a nice gradual increase in that scenario. So that does, uh, as Mitch asked earlier, that does not assume there will be no fossil fuel cars on the road. It's just a, it's a graduated increase. And at the end of the line, there still will be fossil fuel cars, right? 
This is um, the projection on the left, if we can go back to that uh, slide with the EV projections. On the left, this is assuming that all gasoline and diesel powered vehicles are gone. They're off the roads and they're electric vehicles. And then on the right, it's assuming by 2045, 55%, just over half the vehicles on the road are electric by 2045 and the rest are gasoline and diesel and whatever else. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. So then putting these two together and looking at the faster electric vehicle projection and the faster projection for renewable adoption from Hawaii electric uh, press releases so that our renewables reach 100% by 2040 and the electric vehicles actually reach 100% by 2050. The graph, the red lines show the ICE vehicles, um, passenger, in the bright red and freight in the dark red, and then passenger and freight electric vehicles in the blue at the bottom. And as you can see, it's overwhelmingly um, fossil fuel use continues to be from the ICE vehicles. Right. And even once we start to replace um, most of those ICE vehicles with electric vehicles, it's still a very minimal amount of fossil fuel use because our power grid is getting so much cleaner. And when I say ICE, it's the internal combustion engine, gasoline and diesel powered vehicles. And the same trend is clear with the CO2 emissions. So again, in the fastest renewable energy and EV transition scenarios, the passenger ice and freight ice are the lines in the red and the passenger and freight EVs are the blue lines um, below. And you can see a slight rise as we get more and more electric vehicles by 2035, which is about halfway across this graph, the midpoint. Electric passenger and freight vehicles are close to 40% of the vehicles on the road, but renewable power by that point is up to 82%. Uh, to go back to the question I was asking earlier, um, you are assuming that there will be steps taken to incentivize um, electric vehicles and to disincentivize ICE cars, right? ICE vehicles. Yes, you, you, but what assumptions are you making to get these turned? If that's what it takes for this. Uh, scenario with these projections in the paper. I have also um, I have also the projections for the slower EV adoption, which is the Hawaiian Electric Roadmap, reach 55% of EVs. Um, and so it's the same type of scenario development. When you look at the renewable portfolio standard, when we first started talking in Hawaii about getting renewables on the grid. And we had our original mandated goal for 70%, which included efficiency, I think, if I can remember back that far. And everybody thought that was a stretch. That was crazy. You'd never get to 70%. And now we have mandated to get to 100%. And again, when it came out, everyone went, oh, that's crazy. We'll never get to that. And then all sorts of other states and, and nations across the world are adopting very similar uh, targets and goals and mandates. And with electric vehicles and transition to zero emission vehicles, whatever makes sense for where you are, those mandates are happening in the US and various different regions and states and all over the world. And so because of climate change, also when you live in California and your state's literally burning up around you, um, it becomes a little bit more clear what incentives are needed. And I'm not a policy person. I leave that to the good policy folks with the government and all these other nonprofits and good people to you know, figure out how best to incentivize that. There's a lot going on, a lot of different programs around uh, to draw on. Um, I simply looked into, you know, crunching the numbers and see, well, what does it do for us? Mm -hmm. And in the there, paper, well, there are some people out there who feel that the decline of ICE cars will happen as a, as a market matter. In other yeah. words, people will be more interested in them for various... Uh, you know, advertising and, and technological reasons, uh, cost reasons, and they will gradually, you know, phase out. Uh, there are other people who feel uh, that you need government, affirmative government action, either in incentives or disincentives. And I guess uh, you're, getting, you're getting the curves from the Hawaiian Electric Roadmap there. 
but I think, um, if you don't know, just tell me, but it, I think that um, that that has to assume governmental action. And the curve would be different if the government took dramatic um, action right now today and said, we are not gonna allow, some places have done this, we are not, not gonna allow the sale of any, any more ICE cars, or in the alternative, the government uh, locks up and doesn't do anything. And there is no incentive or disincentive to change the curve, in which case, as you get closer to the target date, say 2040, 2045, uh, then you have to take, you know, draconian action, and then the curve, you know, drops like a rocket, like a rock. Um, am I right? This is this is all, yeah. you know, uh, following on the possibilities uh, that there will be a rational decision process going on, either in the mind of the consumer or the legislature. Am I right? Right, right. And so, if you like. Um... Essentially, the curve we're looking at now would imply that there's some significant incentives, federal government as well as state or both, one or the other. Um, but the electric vehicle transition in the roadmap getting to 55%, most people seem to think when electric vehicles uh, reach on par cost with their gasoline counterparts in a few years, uh, that upfront cost to purchase, when that's on par, people will start to buy the electric vehicles a lot more readily. And there's way more models coming out now. They have longer range. The charging infrastructure is growing in leaps and bounds now. Um, and it is a drawback. A lot of people right now, that holds them back. Um, but if you look at the Hawaiian electric projection, it's more conservative. It's more of a gradual increase. So you might look and there's other scenarios we could do. I mean, it'd be fun to play around with all sorts of scenarios and say, okay, well, with this incentive, we think it'll reach this, you know, this much by this date, and then maybe taper off a little bit, or you can play around with all these different um, scenarios. And once you have the basic platform that this uh, paper provides, um, then you can start to plug in, oh, well, what would happen? And hey, what does this look like on Hawaii Island or Maui? And what if we bring in this incentive and we think it's going to have this difference um, to how quickly people adopt the electric vehicles? So the likelihood is going forward, the roadmap will change. It will change because of market forces, yeah. uh, many, many forces at play. It will change because of legislative sentiments. Uh, and, and Lord knows the legislature does change its mind. Uh, and Congress, uh, the, the, that's another study. Um, but it seems to me that if you look again, Kathy, in say two, three, four, five years, okay. that curve is going to be different, and therefore the the results are going to be different, right? So this okay. is the kind of thing you have to keep doing, right? And this gives you an idea right now to look at those two uh, two different projections for electric vehicle adoption, as well as the renewable energy projection, and so it gives you an idea. And it one of the things I found with the scenario analysis is that it's very visual. And so for people who have, you know, a theoretical, they're thinking about the pros and cons and the challenges ahead, um, but to have something that we can say, well, this is the difference that it'll make, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that's part of the reason with the two different scenarios. And one thing that comes out really clearly, you can see by looking at this graph, is that getting rid of the ICE vehicles, because we're already well on our road to renewable energy, we have a mandated standard, one way or another, we'll, we'll get, you know, a lot further along at any rate. But with electric vehicles, there's no mandated um, goal with, with it as yet. Um, and so what comes out of this really clearly is getting rid of the ICE vehicles um, and switching to electric vehicles. Even now, it reduces our fossil fuel use and our CO2 emissions. You know, you know Dave Rolf. I mean, he's, uh, he's a master at doing some of this data analysis. Uh, from my point of view, I think it'd be interesting to look at like what kind of policy um, can be brought into play or incentives, and and what's the impact, and how quickly will they uh, will the public respond to these uh, incentives? Like, is it instantaneous, or will it's they, they they're still comfortable with their car, they can still get gas, blah blah blah, or is it going to be like a shock, and all of a sudden 
uh, people are going to be dumping their internal combustion engine cars and switching over to EVs. Is anybody kind of looking at that, those kinds of effects? Yeah, there's been a lot of work. McKenna Kaufman, who you'll be familiar with, she worked with Sherilyn some years ago, and they did a great study looking at the incentives across the country by state and region, I think it was. <clears throat> and, uh, and so they've, they've dived into that uh, at great extent. Um, and that's, you know, it's really good questions because it raises these, these concerns. And I know a lot of people have, you know, they, they talk about the cost a lot. Like initially, if it's an outlay, um, for additional costs when you're buying the vehicle, you know, that's certainly a consideration. Um, of course, it's good to look at the total cost of ownership. Um, so you look at your maintenance costs and your fuel costs over the life of the vehicle. And that starts to make a huge impact. So depending on how you use that vehicle, uh, that already, it may be cost efficient when you look at that for a fleet and so forth, the buses, for example, and there's good federal, um, federal incentives for switching transit buses over to electric buses already. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different policy aspects. Um, I, I stayed pretty much focused on, on crunching the numbers and I might just, while we have time, move on to the, the summary of the results. That might help put it a little bit in context. So in 2020, seven times less fossil fuel was consumed by an average electric vehicle compared to average gasoline, and CO2 emissions were cut in half by the average gasoline vehicle uh, compared to an average gasoline vehicle, excuse me. And by 2035, roughly the life of a new vehicle purchased at the stage 91% less fossil fuel will be consumed and 70% less CO2 emit, emitted with those faster projections for electric vehicles and renewables. And just with our passenger vehicles on Oahu, by 2045, billions of gallons of gasoline and tens of millions of tons of CO2 could be saved with that faster projection for electric vehicles. So that's where that's where it, it's, it really adds up. It makes a huge difference. And then finally, by 2050, with this faster scenario, 99% less fossil fuel will be used and 93% less CO2 emissions uh, by 2050. So again, it may be pie in the sky at this stage. It may be shooting for the moon, um, but it tells you the benefit of that. But these are impressive changes, impressive um, reductions in fossil fuel. Uh, I wonder if you could help me, though, when, when you say seven times less fossil fuel consumed. Let's, let's assume that 100 units of fossil fuel is consumed. What, how does it translate when you say seven times less of that 100 units? How does it right. come out? Yeah, and so the slide, um, we can go back, if you like, the, the slide. Uh, Early on in the slide deck shows um, the fossil fuel used in 2020. And for an average passenger vehicle, it was uh, 455 gallons of gasoline a year for your average gasoline vehicle. And then comparing that to the amount of fossil fuel burned on the grid, so oil and coal combined, that amount of fossil fuel by energy content, the average electric vehicle is using about the equivalent of 66 gallons of fossil fuel. And of course, it's also running on solar and wind energy. So simply looking at the fossil fuel, we're, we're dropping that fossil fuel use tremendously, even in 2020, because yeah, of the efficiency. People also charge directly off the rooftop. Like my neighbor, you know, loved to watch the meter going backwards as he's, uh, you know, <laughs> plugged in as a Chevy Volt or whatever and uh, was, yeah. was charging it up. So that's, yeah. I, I think it's probably pretty hard to track that in, in this kind of a study. Right. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of that, I think. And I think well, let me, if you let me... more workplace charging, you're going to have, you know, people where there's warehouses and there's good opportunity to put in solar, like Peter was saying, you know, we want to have every roof covered by 2045 in solar. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some technology solutions starting to surface to, to, to put in charging and using backup battery storage for one, but, you know, different technology solutions trying to um, 
They're trying to get uh, a lot less expensive installations in uh, multi-unit dwellings like apartment buildings, office towers. Right. Well, uh, Mitch mentioned earlier, and you've referred to it also, Kathy, that um, these numbers are to show us the dramatic um, reduction in use of fossil fuels over the period, the projected period. Um, but, you know, we want this to be a living, breathing report over time. And it should, you know, be, of course, faithful with changes in the marketplace and the technology, um, you know, and I guess uh, the sentiment of the legislature. But at the same time, it, it should inform the legislature. It should inform the regulators. Right. Um, yeah. And I guess my question, tri tripping off what Mitch was asking you and, and what you've alluded to yourself is, oh, we need to fine tune what they do. They should be aware of these processes as, as these processes exist in your view today and how they change in the future. Um, but they should be they should be equipped with, a, I hate to use this word, with algorithms that would change their incentive um, regulation and legislation so as to meet the goals. Um, and, and I suppose uh, you, were, you said you were crunching numbers, and I imagine that you didn't go to that level. But doesn't, doesn't somebody have to go to that level to give them, to tip them off as to what they need to do numerically? If you wanted to go to that level, and that would be great. I actually uh, talked with the Hawaii Climate Commission and Blue Planet, and we looked at getting a calculator of this nature onto the uh, Climate Commission's website. And at the time, it was beyond our budget. Um, but if, there, if we get some funding and we can put this um, a calculator online, um, and we could extend it, it'd be terrific to extend it for each island so that every island can do this and plug in what did they forecast and even looking five years ahead, what they expect the number of electric vehicles to be, what they expect the renewable energy to be and put that online so that you could have a calculator and every time go in and update it, that'd be fabulous. Well, I think it'd be helpful for the legislature, otherwise they'd be thrashing around they have testimony from this uh, interest group and that interest group, and the, and they wouldn't have a, a sort of a scientific extension of your work. And I think ultimately they do need to have that, especially when it comes time to make the hard choices uh, to incentivize up or down. I think, um, you know, when you read through the whole report, and I'm happy to answer questions offline too, but for anybody in the legislature, if they want to have a look at the report, and look at the other scenarios where you do have the slower electric vehicle adoption and you can see very clearly how much more fossil fuel we're paying for it. You know, our money's leaving Hawaii every day to pay for fossil fuels. Um, and so um, I'm happy to walk people through that. What it does do is provide you the broad strokes of this is how much difference it makes if we incentivize electric vehicles looking ahead five years, 10 years, and so on. And so you can break it down already by how far ahead you're looking, uh, the four different, there's four different scenarios to look at. And so you can look at say that gradual increase to 55% electric vehicles on the road by 2045. Um, and then look at the mandated renewable portfolio standards and look at that as more of a business as usual scenario. Mm -hmm. And so that legislators can look at, well, what difference does it make if we, you know, over the next five, 10 years, we aim to have that global projection for electric vehicles to reach 12.25% of vehicles on the road via uh, electric by 2030. This has the journal publication that is free online access, open, open access. Uh, it's called Sun, Wind and Waves, EV fossil fuel use and emissions on an isolated oil dependent Hawaiian island. The overall trends can be seen in this. Uh, so I think with because of the efficiency of electric vehicles um, and our mandated renewable portfolio standards over the coming years, as long as our well our long term carbon neutral goals for the state, and so it just from the study it just shows that it's it's worthwhile to accelerate EV adoption. 
we're getting to 100% renewables on the grid and talking about uh, technology developments in the future, we can be proud in Hawaii. We have the only grid connected wave energy test site in all of the US. And we just received a uh, 6 million in continued funding from the Navy to continue supporting wave energy development and testing and the related technologies, ocean observing and so forth that help us help us identify hurricanes coming and all that good stuff. So, Okay, we're out of time. Mitch, uh, you want to do your uh, yeah, let's throw post the last summary so we can see how you can contact Catherine? I love that slide too. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> so anyway, we've been uh, talking to Catherine uh, Mackenzie from uh, HNEI, uh, my alma mater as well. And she's put together a great uh, report and a great study, and it's uh, actually been global, which uh, is awesome for her and for HNEI and for Hawaii, actually, because it got us out in front of the whole world. So this is really good stuff and some good information. And uh, we'll make everybody think, in particular, we hope the legislators and policymakers uh, really zoom in on this. So thank you so much for bringing this to our attention, uh, Kathy, and for coming out and telling us about it today here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Signing off, and thank you, Jay. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Kathy. Aloha, you guys. We, we should revisit the same subject again uh, for your next report, your next project. You have to come on, and we'll, right. we'll have a further discussion, Kathy. All right. Thanks very much, Jay. Thanks, Mitch.